Hello everyone, my name is Dave. Welcome to your third tutorial on a building APIs and microservices with Laravel Lumen. In this tutorial, we'll be looking at a more in-depth and a visual explanation of what APIs, of what the whole system is. So um, up here, you will see um, the architecture of a monolithic application. This is the kind of default application that people tend to build and uh, is the old way of building applications. Right now, the new way is using microservices. So this is the old way where you have monolithic application. I'll be explaining uh, what goes on here. So you have your team of developers building several features. We could call this product feature, different features in your application. So these guys are sitting here building several different features. And then they have to deploy it and it has to go live and when it goes live remember that this um this is one application that has several features and of course the database is here to one database that controls everything now um so while they're building it they are going through a phase called the build phase and then they have a test team that will test then they have to release sometimes you have a complete team that handles this build test and release depending on how big the the company is so if you're working on a monolithic, monolithic application, you encounter a whole lot of problems. Number one, it's not easily scalable. Number two is that if this guy that is working on this particular feature wants to change something or import a new library or do something different, he has to talk with these other guys and make sure that what he's doing is not breaking the rest of the application. You understand? So uh, he wants to make sure that what, what he's doing in his own, uh, the feature is building doesn't break the rest of the features other people are building so in big up in big companies you have things like um, release friday or test friday so they build for four days on friday everybody comes to all the developers come to a meeting and they start discussing to make sure that i'm um, reviewing their codes to make sure that um they don't uh make mistakes and then um, what somebody else built is not uh, breaking what the other person else built so um uh, I've, I've given you definitions of this in in the past video and um well here i'll give you a more detailed definition of which one which i really like it was made by adrian cockcroft uh he said a microservice is a service oriented architecture um, which means the services communicate with each other and share data and then secondly he said it's a service oriented architecture composed of loosely coupled elements that are bounded context so um the elements the, which are features that you're building they are loosely coupled they are 100 percent independent of each other they're completely independent of each other and you can make any updates in any of them without worrying whether it will break anything and then they have bounded context so um which means uh, since they are independent and have bounded context this guy doesn't need to know the internal workings of this guy how this guy retrieves his orders or products or whatever before he can build a payment api for it okay so uh, let's look at what if we have to redesign change this whole process or uh, to change it to a microservice architecture this is how a microservice architecture works all right so um, you have a database it could be your DynamoDB, Elastic Search, caches, uh, cache, Elastic Cache, and Elastic whatever. Then you have your locations uh, database. I made a mistake here. You have your locations database. You can have multiple databases, or matter of fact, you can have different databases for all this. Not tables now, but databases. So um, it's possible, and then you can have one database for everything, depending on uh, how your team decides. But then you now have on um, services. So this is a block of code that um, manages everything about restaurants so um, maybe the this collects the details of the restaurants and um, is able to produce the all the restaurants when demanded for it so this block of code manages restaurants it makes a call to the database and um, retrieves its data and uh, also updates the database sometimes managing restaurants may involve some payment so this guy can make a call to another service this is a payment service it manages everything about payments in your application. It's a block of code that manages everything about payments. So what this payment services does is it gets information from the database. It can also get from another service. Let's say we are zooming in this diagram that is getting also from restaurant service. 
and uh, don't mind the spelling and then this is order service and uh, this is location service so the location service may in this diagram i'm assuming that the location service is not getting the details about the location from the same database so it can be getting from another database it doesn't matter and then it can be getting information from payment and exchanging information with the payment service at the end all these services give out something called an api gateway which is uh, basically a list of endpoints so uh, this guy is an endpoint this guy is an endpoint it's basically an endpoint is basically a url a way that uh, something that uh, another application can use to access this service so remember that this is a restaurant service there are many things you can do in a restaurant for instance you can create a new restaurant you can view the created restaurants you can view all restaurants created by me or a certain user a lot of things so for each of these things you can do with respect to restaurants you will have an API an endpoint for it all right so this one basically uh, maybe views all restaurants so you or whoever is building this service determines what the endpoint would be but then since it's the same website all of them may have the same um, starting point which you have your site.com and in some cases it's not really the same website in some cases like in the location issue we may have another website so where, where we have a second website.com to access locations all right so this um, restaurant service has different um, uh, modules and um, therefore different endpoints so if somebody wants to view the list of restaurants they will just uh, inside their code it doesn't matter what language they're using to build their code they could be using javascript they could be using php python ruby whatever but inside their code they make a call to this endpoint and the endpoint automatically hits this service this service go to the database it goes to the database and generates a list of all restaurants and sends it back as json in json format in the past video i showed you what a json format looks like which is basically data sends it back as data and displays to this so what the user basically sees is a white page with json data if the user were to visit this or your this url directly otherwise their application will read out json data on that page and make use of it all right so um these two endpoints okay this one is for payment so um same thing with payments uh, something like this could mean that um somebody the user with id of 50 is making a payment of 123 dollars for the product with the id of five so when the when the application or the mobile app or whatever uh, your end user is using hits this particular url this url hits this payment service and this payment service already knows how to decode this it uses it to process the payment save it in the database and give a response back something called a response which means the application is wait once it hits this is waiting for a response the response will tell it whether the transaction was successful or not whether it failed and whatever happened all right so the proper way to actually build this api is to version it because you are trying to avoid a situation in which people will you are trying to avoid a situation in which changing one endpoint or one of these services will not break the rest everything will be working perfectly while you are implementing brand new changes or brand new features you know you can build a, a new application by just calling certain endpoints just combining one endpoint from here one from here one from here and one from here and then you have a new application for instance out of these uh, services somebody can build a, uh, an application that displays lists of restaurants around you so the, the person makes use of this api api for locations and apis for uh, restaurant services and um, builds a mobile app that displays list of restaurants around you somebody else can build an a, 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 an application that helps people to order for food from a restaurant so they make use of restaurant uh, service um, apis and ordering service apis so with a combination of these you can build endless features so what if somebody is trying to build in a new module inside the restaurant service it should not um, or improve an already existing model you should not break this um these other modules like now the payment service is making a call to one of the modules inside here it should not break it and it should not also break the third party applications that were built they were making calls to this so if you expose your api to the public sometimes you go to some website to see their api click on the api menu 
you see that their APIs are available to the public. They explain what each endpoint does. So you can have thousands of devices calling your APIs. You don't want to break those devices when you change something. All right. So to avoid that, you version your API. So um, instead of just having YouTube uh, your site.com slash restaurant slash all, we could have your site.com slash API slash version one, which is V1 slash restaurants slash all. So when you want to um, improve uh, the data or improve the restaurants or mo module, maybe you added some new things that will be retrieved when uh, the, the user makes a call to this URL. You can make it version two. So it will be your site.com slash API slash V2 slash restaurant that slash all. So all the applications making call to V1 will not notice any change at all. The only thing is that you go and do a press release on your website's blog that your the version two of your API is now available, then they can go to your API documentation, see the sample data that is returned or why you improved it to version two. So inside their own phone or their third party application, they can simply change the URL they are making call to, to version two and take and rewrite their code to handle uh, version two. All right. So you, you basically version your APIs. Very important, very, very, very important. So this is how it works. A user visits, um, a user comes from the browser, hits your browser, www.yourwebsite.com, and then they see a storefront, maybe uh, this storefront could be your website or whatever you're using. And then this web, this web, your website makes call, different com components or parts of your website make calls to different APIs and then gets data and uses it to construct itself. I'll show you an example. And um, this may not just be your website. You, you don't necessarily be the one, need to be the one building this. Somebody else might get a website from somewhere else. As long as they can read your documentation, they can use your APIs to get data and uh, work on their own uh, platform. So um, a whole lot of things can be here, be done here. Then you, somewhere right here, you could build a, um, some, some people wonder why would I have to make my API public? How will I, what will I gain from it? The, one of the ways you can gain from making your API public is to make sure that people pay. So you log each call. If somebody visits, if somebody makes a call, the mobile app of, uh, of uh, your client makes a call to this, you can record it that my client with the user ID of uh, XYZ is making a one call to this um, API. So you save it in the database. If it makes another call, you can say this guy is making a second call. So you're saving it in the background. Which means you can put a pricing page on your website where people see that 5,000, anything below 5,000 calls per day is free. Anything above 5,000 calls per day is cost $50 or $100. So you put some price into it. So you actually monitor how many calls each of your clients, third party clients make to this API. As you monitor the calls, uh, you can decide to charge them. You understand? So when he makes the 5,001 call, you can block the, the call and give them a response that your API, you need to pay to continue using this API as a response. All right. So it's, it's a really interesting, it's a very, very big market that many people haven't explored. And um, let me just show you a YouTube uh, website. This is YouTube website. And as you can see, it's showing me how many views I already have on my videos this is a service that produces views this is a service that generates the number of subscribers when called and uh, basically every component you're seeing is a service this menu was generated by a service uh, look at this this guy um, returns the list of the videos I've made on YouTube it's a service so this particular section of this page makes a call to an endpoint that produces list of videos made by my id my youtube id and then it gives this then this website displays this all right this one is also a service basically everything you're seeing is a service also if you check out the subscription button it's a service too list of videos here is a service so basically this page is making calls to service and youtube api is open which means you can build an app that makes use of youtube uh, api so you Google it and you can see the list of their public API and read it and be able to implement it in your application. So it's a really interesting 
modern architecture for building applications. Many big websites have migrated, like Amazon has migrated, um, Git, GitHub has migrated, a whole lot of websites or, or companies have migrated from uh, the monolithic architecture style to the microservice architecture style. So in the next video, we'll continue with Laravel Lumen. Like I told you, Laravel Lumen is just one web, one application for building uh, APIs. There are many of them, many of them. I just pre prefer Laravel Lumen. And then for other videos, I'll make videos for other ones, all right? All right, thank you very much. See you in the next video tutorial. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. See you.